Hi everybody, welcome to class. Today we're going to talk about the Counter-Reformation. Monday we talked about the Reformation. And so now, today we talk about the church reforming back, striking back at the Reformation. Um, so just to start off, because uh, we're going to cover a couple things today. We're going to cover the Counter-Reformation, like what it was, what it sprung from. We're going to talk about another thing called mannerism. Mannerism is an art form that comes out of this same time period and is connected to it. And then we're going to talk about the, the results of this whole thing, where we end up sort of by the end of the 1500s. So all this stuff we're really talking about today is mostly 1500s today. Um, we, still haven't, we still haven't quite got out of the 1500s. This, by the way, actually is from the 1600s, but this is a... Uh, a statue called the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. It's by a guy named Bernini. Bernini's going to be a big name that we're going to see later on. Um, again, 16th century, high Baroque period. Um, but, uh, yeah. just I point this out now because this will come back again. Um, you're going to be talking about St. Teresa on Friday uh, with Dr. Tate Peterson. All right. Counter-Reformation. Let's do it. So, we just talked about the Reformation. Fantastic. All the stuff that's going on there. If you want to remember that, go review your notes. That's great. Let's go back to Italy. Because all that Reformation crap was happening up in the north. Um, northern Germany, and eventually in England, and places in Scandinavia. It's happening up there. But what about down in Italy? What's going on down in Italy? So we're going to head back to Italy like where we started this semester with the Renaissance. Um, first thing is, the Renaissance freedom still in full swing. This This whole sort of the, the mood of humanism and uh, Neoplatonism and the art movement and the, all that kind of stuff is, just, is still going strong um, about the time that Martin Luther's doing his thing up north. It, it's really not, I mean, what Martin Luther was that 1520s and, and the Renaissance is still going well. So that's one thing. Uh, a second idea is you, you have multiple wars that are being fought in Italy between France and the Holy Roman Empire. They are constantly fighting over this area, saying, this piece is mine, no, this piece is mine. And it's just uh, basically the late 1400s all the way through the 1500s, this is a bit of a war zone to the point where by, I think it's, I want to say it's 1527, um, Rome actually gets sacked again. Like it gets captured, I guess you could say. And, and here's the deal with this. This is again if you're one of the people who's into the freedom stuff fantastic but what about everybody else they're going man everybody's going off in their own direction they're doing this they're doing this they're doing this that's a little unnerving it's not it's 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 not exactly the way things have been done and it makes me nervous about what's coming next this very unnerving like all these things are really creating um instability and people are reacting to that instability like ugh. I just, I don't really like this very much. I mean, it's, you know, maybe young people love this kind of, you know, excitement and all that, but the rest of us are like, Ugh, I don't really, it's, it's making me nervous, I guess you could say. And then the church and the papacy is really, looks entangled in these things. You could say, well, I'll just go back, I'll just turn to the church, the anchor, all that kind of stuff. But the church, the papacy is in the heart of this whole thing. It is fighting, it is part of these wars as much as anybody. It is sort of vacillating between full freedom and kind of reigning in the freedom all the time. It is, the church isn't that stable thing anymore either. And so what is the mood that you get out of this? What's, what's the mood of the people in Italy in general? And most of it is this. Um, they want reform. Um, the way things are going aren't going well. Now, when they say reform, they sort of say, look, I kind of like some of the things Luther's talking about. That makes a lot of sense. But, man, he had 95 theses. I'm not going to agree with all 95 of those things. That's crazy. Um, and his results kind of stink because he says, oh, here's all the bad things about the church. Therefore, we're leaving. Or, therefore, the, the Pope is the Antichrist. I mean, he's just taking it a little too far. Like, I get you want some reform, but, but you know, pull back a little bit. One of the common... Uh, problem people have with, say, Marxism or even communism is that, yeah, it makes some good critiques about capitalism the way things are, but global revolution 
feels like a step too far. You want to pull that back a little bit. Don't get quite so excited about it. So that's the same thing here. Some of Luther's ideas were good, but man, he just, he just takes it a little too far. And in fact, there's this sort of, uh, there's this fad, I guess you could say, that happens in Italy at this time called Nicodemism. Now, if you remember your Bible, remember Nicodemus in the Bible, it's the I want to say he's like a priest who secretly meets with Jesus and um, eventually sort of converts to Christianity, but he just keeps it on the DL. Doesn't want to let anybody know about this. Little, his, you know, his little his side action there is Protestantism. Same thing here is people kind of caught, thinking of themselves as secret Protestants. I'm a Catholic in everything I'm doing out there. I'm going to the church, doing all the rituals, all that. But deep down, I'm kind of I'm buying into some of that that reform stuff. And then there's this, for many, there's this desire to return to the good old days of Catholicism, whatever that means. And that's one of those great things is you can say, I want to go back to the good old days. Well, you know, there's a thousand years of good old days. Like, which, which good old day do you want to go to? I mean, honestly, Martin Luther said the same thing. I want to go back to the good old days of the church, back before the church added all this crap to it and starts doing indulgences and start leading us down the path. So I want to go back to the early church. That's what I want. That's the same thing here. Is we want to go back. There's this desire to go back to the good old days of Catholicism. It just is this question of when those good old days are. But mostly what they're really talking about here is they want to go back to the time when there weren't the abuses and corruption of the church and the clergy in the church. Now, was there ever that time? That's not the point. The point is they want to go back to that time. They want to get those abuses and corruption out of there. Which is sort of one of the terms that we use in Protestantism is like a revival. And that's kind of what they're talking about here is they want to sort of revive the church. So the renew Christ, Catholic uh, religious thought. And, and there's a few ways this is kind of done. Um, they want to do it through a deeper spirituality, like a, a, a more of a connection. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying this very well. We're going to talk about this here in a second, like with the mystics, but this idea that it's not just the way I get to God is through the church, but God and I are more closely connected than that. That's kind of what we mean by deeper spirituality there. Uh, more concern about Christian life than church, riches, and prestige. Remember, as the church is going through the Renaissance, it is embracing a lot of those ideas of the Renaissance, like glory and beauty and art and all that kind of stuff. And while you might, while we might look back and say, man, I'm really glad they painted the, the Sistine Chapel. It's super cool. Think about the people at the time. They're going, yeah, it's cool, but man, that's super expensive. And why is the church taking our money and spending it on that? Shouldn't the church be more concerned about church stuff rather than pretty pictures and looking really rich and being really cool? And not just the central church, the Pope, but all the churches have, you know, if there's one place in the city where there is, or in the town where there is money and wealth, it's going to be the church. Monasteries that have existed for 500 years, um, over time, they've built up a lot of wealth. Like It's a monastery with poor monks, and yet it's one of the wealthiest places in the area. So more concerned with Christian life than church riches and prestige. And then, again, as we saw with Luther and Erasmus, this return to the New Testament. Not just return to the New Testament in the sense of like they had never moved away from the New Testament, but the New Testament becomes the main authority, which means we also need to know what the New Testament said. So all this stuff is just sort of saying, even though the Protestant Reformation is going on, it's not like the Catholics, particularly down in Italy, but the rest of Catholicism was saying, yeah, we don't need reform. No, they were on board. They said, yes, we need to fix things. It's just we don't need to fix things the way Luther did because Luther broke more things than he fixed. So how'd that look? Let me give you three models of reform here. Model reform number one. So again, what are sort of the early reactions of Catholicism to this? The first one is what we call reform of the friars monk, minor, or what we would call monks. Um, so there had always been, in the Middle Ages, these um, monastic orders. Um, like one of the more famous would be, whoops, the Franciscans. The Franciscans say, look, we got to go back to that St. Francis of Assisi model. You know, he was super, he was super into poverty and things like that. And over the next two, three hundred years, the Franciscans had really sort of shifted a little bit and been a little less poverty. And so there's people inside, there's, there's monks inside of the Franciscan order, which says, I mean, we, we got to go back to the old times. 
um, poverty, spirituality. That's what it needs to be about, not about making money, getting glory, all that kind of stuff. Um, another group that gets formed at this time, again, it's like they look around, they say, man, I, I'm looking up, I want to be a monk, I want to be a part of a monastic order, but I think all the monastic orders right now are kind of doing it wrong. So rather than form, a, you know, rather than join an order and kind of reform it, let's just kind of form a new order and show them how to do it right. And this is where you get the Capuchins, the Capuchin order, and, and their focus is on charitable work. Like they, their main priority is sort of giving back. And you still see this sort of em emphasis today, like um, uh, a lot of uh, homeless shelters and hospitals and things like that come out of this sort of idea of that's what the church, and particularly people who give their lives to the church, these monks should be doing this. All right, so that's one thing, is sort of the monastic orders kind of try to fix themselves. Another model of reform is what we call the clerk's regular. Now, it's pretty easy to get these two things confused between the monks and the clerk's regular. Like, those of us who aren't Catholic might just say, oh, they're all priests, or they're all, you know, pastors or whatever you want to say. But these are very different things. And here's, here's why. The, when, the, when a monk joins a, the monastic order, that monk is then assigned usually to a particular convent, a um, particular place. They are placed in a place, and that's where they are. The, um, so essentially, it's like joining a team. Um, the clerks regular are much more like free agents. They're kind of they're kind of their own thing. Um, so the priests, these are priests that don't have churches and don't have monasteries. They go where they're needed. So there's a problem over here. We head over there. There's a problem over here. We head over there. We essentially go wherever we think that we are needed. Um, it's less about being assigned a place and more about doing something. And so um, what, what they want, I don't know if I'm making that ex exactly clear, but what they want is, is the clergy to be respected by the people again. Because they look at the clergy and they say, man, that, that, that priest who's assigned to that, um, to that church, hmm, he's not well respected. Um, it, they, they're like, I guess the, here's the best analogy I can make for the Protestants among us. If the monks and the priests are like pastors of churches... These guys are like the evangelists who kind of roam around, you know, go on TV, who go here and there, and they don't have a place, but they have a following, I guess you could say, and that's kind of the way to think about this. They want to restore the dignity of the priestly office. Like, they are almost like trying to do revivals however they go. Charity towards the suffering and the poor. This makes it sound like they're seeking glory because I, I use the word evangelist, like televangelist, and that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is they're, they're really sincere. They really want this to be done better, and they don't think the structures are doing it, so they're kind of working around the structures, I guess is the way to say that. And really the most famous one is what we call the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits that formed in the early 1500s. Um, and the whole the whole bit here is the, the Jesuits, this guy, um, why can't I think of his name right now? Okay, I blanked on his name. He, he's one of your, uh, Francis Xavier, there you go. Um, he, when, when they form, when they form this, these Jesuits, it's like a group of you know, 12 college buddies who got together and said, let's do this different. Yeah, let's do this different. And they all kind of you know, jazzed it. And they formed the Society of Jesus. And what they end up doing is they go from Spain where they were in college together and they head over to Rome and they basically go to the Pope and they say, hey, we're something new. We're here. You sign us wherever you want to. We'll be like your foot soldiers. Whatever you need, we got you. We're not going to, we don't work for a monastery. We don't work for the, the, even the church so much as we work for you, the Pope. You send us where you need us. So that's a new model of reform. Um, and we'll see the Jesuits pop up again and again. A third model is Christian mysticism, which we're going to talk more about on Friday. So I'm just going to give you a little bit here. But the idea here is the individual is directly transformed by God's presence. So the other two were kind of structural reforms, right? One is sort of reforming the orders that exist. One is creating this new idea of an order, the clerk's regular within the church. This is more of an individual basis where essentially reform of the big church starts with you. And it's essentially the individual becomes touched by God. And again, going back to this 
ecstasy of St. Teresa, the, what you're going to read is that she is touched by God. She is transformed by the presence of God. Sometimes the language is even union with God. Um, almost uh, on, a, on a weird sort of erotic basis, which, again, this statue has often been sort of compared less to, you know, Jesus is, or God is speaking to her, but it's almost like, a, again, the ecstasy that essentially it's more of an erotic thing almost. It's, it's an odd thing. Hopefully we talk about that on Friday. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's, this is an inner transformation, the transformation of the person, not the world. I'm not trying to change the world. I'm trying to change me. And by changing me, it will change the world. Uh, in the 20th century, Gandhi is going to make this sort of way of thinking, not in Christianity, but in Hinduism, sort of a, a dominant thing where the best way to change the world, if you want peace, if you want justice, then it starts with you. You have to be transformed. You have to see the justice in the world in yourself first. All right. So just some names here. Teresa of Avila. I'm sorry. I said Francis Xavier. I meant this. Ignatius of Loyola. That's the guy. Francis Xavier did something else. He was a, he was a Jesuit too, but not the guy who started the whole thing. Uh, John of the Cross, Ignatius of Loyola. These are all mystics that that their story is that they were going down the bad path and they were transformed by the presence of God. And that provides models for everybody else to be transformed and thereby transform the church. All right, we're going to take a break here and you're going to watch a video um, from a guy uh, from the Catholic Church, uh, Bishop Barron, who, who speaks a lot about many things. And he's going to talk about the... Um, the reforms that the church did, the the Council of Trent, and again, it's from a it's from a Catholic position, which is different than the one that I can give you. So I think it's going to be a better one. So I'll meet you back here in a second.